Okay, so once again, so Parshas Vayera, page 79. So it begins, Hashem appeared to him in the plains of Mamre while he was sitting at the entrance of the tent in the heat of the day. And here, the Hebrew is Vayera, which literally means, and he appeared. And um, the and, so actually, I'm going to mute everybody. I'll allow everybody to unmute themselves. <laughs> Let's get this started. Here we go. Okay, try that again. So, um, the last week's Parsha end with Avram giving a bris mila, circumcising his entire family, his son Yishmael, and himself. And this is a direct continuation of, the, of that. That's why it begins with an and, not in the article translation, but in the Hebrew, Vayera, and he appeared, Hashem appeared, and Hashem appeared to him in the plains of Mamre while he was sitting at the entrance of the tent in the heat of the day, that this is connected to the previous incident of the bris mila, of the circumcision, that it says that, and then Hashem appeared to him, and our sages say that he was fulfilling the mitzvah of visiting the sick. Because Avram was in a state of extreme discomfort after this, our sages say this was the third day following his bris mila, following his circumcision, which is a very painful stage of the healing. So Hashem was visiting him to, um, to um, give him that um, comfort of being visited while he was in pain and while he was sick. And it continues in verse two, and he lifted his eyes and saw, and behold, three men were standing over him, he perceived. So he ran towards them from the entrance of the tent and bowed towards the ground. And he said, my Lord, if I find favor in your eyes, please pass not away from your servant. And then it goes through everything he did in order to, um, to ensure that they had a very pleasant stay. It says, let some water be brought, wash your feet, we'll climb beneath the tree. Verse five, I'll fetch a morsel of bread that you may sustain yourself, then go on and as much as you have passed your servant's way. They said, do so just, if you have, just if you have, as you have said. And in verse six, so Avram hastened to the tent to Sarah and said, hurry, three saw of meal, fine flour, knead and make cakes. Then Avram ran to the cattle, took a calf tender and good and gave it to the youth who hurried to prepare it. He took cream and milk and the calf which he had prepared and, and placed these before them. He stood over them beneath the tree and they ate. So one thing you see here, which is something our sages point out, is that um, there's a statement that of Musser, of um, ethics that they say, which is, which is, say a little and do a lot. This is the media, this is the attribute of a righteous person, that they don't talk big. They're not big talkers, they're big doers. And they just say, they don't talk a big storm and then just do a little bit. They talk just a little bit and they do a lot following that. And that's illustrated here, where in verse four, what Avram told them that he would do is, let some water be brought and wash your feet and recline beneath the tree. So he said, all we're gonna do is bring some water. You can, you can, you can wash yourself up, you can, you, can, you can rest, and I will fetch a morsel of bread, just a little bit, just some water and some bread. Whereas what he actually did, after just talking a little bit, offering them some rest, some water and some bread, is that he had his wife bake them cakes, bake them bread, and then slaughtered, it says a calf. I say to say it's actually three calves that he slaughtered, and um, in order to give each of them the tongue with mustard, which is the choicest piece of meat. So, um, and uh, something that's illustrated here, this is really a theme of the Parsha. Every Parsha really has a theme. And the theme of the, this Parsha seems to be Hachnasas Arachim, which is taking care of guests, welcoming people into your, house, into your home. And that's illustrated here as Avraham, even though he was in tremendous amount of pain, and from the healing of the circumcision, he ran out, he was waiting by the entrance of the tent, looking out to try to find a guest. And he found some passerbys and welcomed them into his tent and took very good care of them. Later on in the Parsha, Lot um, welcomed people into his house and offered them some food and a place to sleep, even in, in putting his life in danger for that. He was in a place where that was illegal and he still did that. He risked his life in order to give some people who they thought he thought were people a uh, place to stay. And um, later in the Parsha, we see a little bit of the opposite where Avraham was um, commanded by Hashem through Sarah really, to send his concubine Hagar and her son Yishmael away from it, send them out of his house. And it discusses the pain that that caused Avraham. 
so which is a little bit of the opposite of the Hafnas's Arachim, but we see that it disturbed him that he had to send his family out of his house, where his house was such a welcoming place for any other guest. And um, the basis of comments in the name of a Rabbi Yaakov, who was the Dayan, he was the judge in the city of Vilna, a rabbi in the city of Vilna, that um, there's a statement our sages say is that everything has mazel. And they say even Sefer Torahs have mazel. They have what we, what we usually called luck, and I'll go into it in a second. And he says, what does that mean that a Sefer Torah has mazel, Sefer Torah has luck? That you find some Sefer Torah that we read every week. There's one Sefer Torah pretty much in the shul that we use every single week. And there are other Sefer Torah. We have a lot of Sefer Torahs sitting in the ark. And we never take them out except in Simchas Torah. They never, there are Sefer Torahs that almost never get taken out and there are Sefer Torahs that are used every day. And there's not necessarily anything that we could look at and point at the Sefer Torah and say, that's why we use this one as opposed to that one. But it's just the way it is. That some Sefer Torahs get used all the time and some get used occasionally and some rarely get used and some are only taken out for Simchas Torah when we dance with them. And, um, he said, and this is true about people, that people have mazel, that there are some people who are successful and some people in business, let's say, financially successful, some who aren't. And we can't necessarily point to a um, mitzvah that they did or some, a righteous, um, anything that they did to deserve, that this person deserves to be wealthy, this person doesn't, but they have mazel, that's their mazel, that's their luck in a sense. And just as an aside, what this means, um, the, I think this is based on the Derech Hashem, but I know Chaim Friedlander this, um, describes this idea of mazel, of what we call luck, is that everybody has a job to do in this world. We weren't created for nothing, not um, the world wasn't created for nothing, and no individual was created for nothing. We're all in here for a purpose. We're all put in this world because there's something that we could do and only we could do. That we have a unique blend of talents and um, and weaknesses and a unique situation where we're put in and we're put, all of those things we have all of our talents all of our weaknesses and the situation we're in is because that that's what's necessary for what we are put here to accomplish in this world and some people are put in this world to overcome the tests of wealth and some people are put in this world to overcome the tests of poverty that um and some people they they just need to um be able to thrive and, and keep the Torah in a situation through great financial difficulties. And that's what their um, job and what their talents and what their abilities dictate, that that's what they should be doing in this world. And when, if they do that, they fulfilled their mission in life and made the world a better place and a more holy place through that. There are other people who are put here because um, they're supposed to be overcome the challenges of being wealthy. They have to remain loyal to the Torah in spite of the fact that they could get whatever they want, really, without apparently needing help from above. And they need to recognize that everything they have comes from above, even though they have lots of financial security. And they have to be able to stay, remain humble and um, remain um, gracious to others in spite of the fact that they're richer and uh, perhaps more powerful than others. So, and the, the Derech Hashem, or Moshe Chaim Lutzata says, that's what mazel is. Mazel, what we call luck, is just a matter of what were we put here for. And, for, for some, and what we're put here for dictates what kind of situation we'll live through and what our resources and our environment will be like. And, um, but um, our sages say that's true about Sefer Torahs as well, that Sefer Torahs have mazel. Sometimes, some are used every day, some are, some are used three times a week, some are used all the time, some are almost never used, and um, to where I'm going. And so the um, basis of extends this to not only our Sifri Torah have mazel, but Parshius in the Torah, sections of the Torah, the weekly Torah portion also has mazel. And he gives this week's Parsha as an example. That this week's Parsha, Parsha's Vayera, like I, like I mentioned, the theme of the Parsha is um, having guests is being welcoming to outsiders into our house and to take care of them. And next week's Parsha, Parsha's Chai Sara, is um, be, it's called the life of Sara and it deals with the death of Sara and how Avram went about burying her and how he negotiated for a burial and he buried her with great honor. So um, whereas this week's Parsha is about Achnas's Archim, bringing in guests, next week's Parsha is about burying the dead. 
And he said, these are two parshias right next to each other, one after the other. Yet, and he says, in, in every community, even the smallest community, you have 10 Jews in the community, you still, every community, the one thing that they have is a burial society. And that's taken very seriously. I know that I have some friends in the, whose parents are in the Chavar Kedisha, the burial society in, in, in Flatbush, in New York. And they say it's very competitive. It's something they only allow anybody in if they're like a very important person because it's considered, it's sacred work. And um, the dignity of the deceased is something that, that people, that, that ha we have to be very sensitive about. And they only allow, they only allow special people in. And um, you won't, and you won't find even the smallest community. They have that's what the one thing that they have, the one club they have, is the burial society. And um, and just to illustrate this, I have a. Um, I grew up in St. Louis, where I grew up. I have somebody who lives across the street, Mrs. Kramer, an elderly lady, and she's from not she's from Knoxville, Tennessee. And she told me that the, um, the community there got started, the community, the Jewish community in Knoxville, Tennessee got their start when a, civil, when a Civil War soldier died. There was a Jewish soldier who died in Knoxville or, or from Knoxville and there was nobody to bury him. And they sent to Savannah, which was the big Jewish community of the South, they sent to Savannah for some help, and that was the beginning, the seed, really, of the Jewish community in Knoxville. I just found that very interesting that we had that connection. But um, the burial society is taken very seriously, and he says to the point also that that many communities had a custom that when they read Parshas, Parshas Chai Yisara, that next week's Parsha, which deals with bear, Avram burying Sarah, there's a custom that the, um, the burial society fasts, and um, you'd find many members of the burial society crying in a corner, the head of the burial society, maybe fasting and crying and begging forgiveness for any possible slights he may have, um, he may have committed and any time that he may have treated the dead with the lack of the dignity and respect that they deserve. And, um, you may, and others as well. And maybe all the members of the society are crying, begging forgiveness from the deceased for any for any, any lack of dignity that they treated them with. Yet, he says, that's next week's Parsha. This week's Parsha, which is about, about welcoming guests, which is a major theme of this Parsha, and it's stressed about how Avram excelled in this. He's saying, bigger communities may have a very good um, welcoming society. I know in Savannah we have a group that, um, that takes care of any guests that they hear coming through. Um, and that's, th thankfully, that's something that we have in our, in our city. But um, he says, you don't find the same, you don't find on Parshas Vayera that the welcoming society gets to, has a fast and begs forgiveness for any people, any guests that they possibly treated with a lack of dignity. And he says that nobody, that when it comes to the burial society, nobody's ever complained to the burial society that they were treated wrong. That's just the nature of the job is that the people that you're dealing with don't complain about being mishandled. But um, many people do complain about accommodations. People, when they have, like, they, it seems that in Europe they had uh, hotels for the guests. They had like um, houses where they keep the, um, the guests and the poor. And may, the poor may complain that the bed was uncomfortable, the pillow, I have a backache because uh, the pillow was no good. And they complain, yet we don't find the host begging forgiveness from the guests once a year for having not fulfilled their mitzvah properly. So he just says that illustrates that a, a parsha has mazel as well and a mitzvah has mazel. And, this, and that's why in this week's parsha it stresses so much how Avraham excelled in the fulfillment of, the mitzvah, of this mitzvah of wel being welcoming. Now, of course, it's very difficult in present circumstances to welcome people into our, house, in our homes. But um, he says that and that's why it's stressed so much in order that we should understand that this is something that's so important to the Jewish people and was important to the found the father of the, the, the forefather of the Jewish people. Okay, so now moving on a little bit. And let's see. So the eight. these three men were um, were angels. Just to be clear, and on page eighty-one. 
verse 9, it says, They said to him, Where is Sarah your wife? And he said, Behold, in the tent. I say to say that he, they, that the angels knew where Sarah was, that she was in the tent. Why were they asking where she was? It was in order to um, cause Avraham to think about her in a positive light. That um, because she was in the tent, she wasn't with them because of her sneeze, because of her modesty, and they were trying, and they were emphasizing that modesty to Avram, so he should see her in a positive light. And in verse ten, and he said, "I will surely return to you at this time next year, and behold, sorry, your wife will have a son." Now Sarah was listening at the entrance of the tent, which was behind him. In verse eleven, now Sarah, Avram and Sarah were old, well on in years. The manner of women has ceased to be. With Sarah, she has she has ceased her menstrual cycle. She was old, she was 90 years old, or 89 at this time, I guess. And um, it would have been physically impossible for her to have a child. And in verse 12, and Sarah laughed at herself, saying, after I have withered, shall I again have a delicate skin, and my husband is old. Then Avram said to Avram, why is it that Sarah laughed, saying, shall I in truth bear a child, though I have aged? Is there anything beyond Hashem? At the point of time, I'll return to you at this time next year, and Sarah will have a son. And in verse 15, Sarah denied it, saying, I did not laugh, for she was frightened. But he said, no, you laughed indeed. So Rav Shem Schwab explains this conversation that Sarah wasn't denying a truth. She wasn't straight, she wasn't, and it wasn't that Sarah was lying because she was afraid of what Avram would, would do to her. It's that this laughing that she laughed at herself was deep inside. It was something that was deep inside um, her subconscious that she laughed at it in a, um, in a, I would say, Leitanus, in a jesting manner. And because of her fear, she didn't recognize that. She didn't want to see that in herself. So she didn't recognize that, that's, that, was, that's, that she was actually laughing at hearing that. And in um, verse 16, it states, so the men got up from there, gazed down towards Sodom, while Avram walked with them to escort them. Okay, so now we're, why were there three men. There are three angels. So why, why were there three? Why wasn't one enough? So I say to say that an angel is, each, each angel has its own unique mission that it's sent on. That an angel does not have two different missions. Angels are messengers of Hashem. They're sent. This is his job. This is his job. This is his job. So one of their jobs was to let Sarah know, to tell Sarah, Avram and Sarah that they were going to have a son the next year. One of their jobs was to heal. Um, one of their jobs was, as we're going to see, was to destroy the city of Sodom, and one of them was to um, had a double mission. It was to heal Avraham from his bris milah, and that was the angel Rafal, the angel of healing, and to save Lot from the city of Sodom. So, which was since there was both a healing type of mission, so it was considered the same mission. Okay. So now it continues. And so the men got up from there, they gazed down towards Sodom while Avram walked with them to escort them. Gazing, whenever it talks about Hashem, or in this case, an angel gazing, Ayashkafa, this is, um, our sages say, is always a um, dangerous thing and usually means something bad is happening because gazing means taking a close look at something. And we're when we're talking about the heavens, taking a close look at something, um, that means they're weighing is, are they deserving or not? And when the, the question is, are they deserving or not? Very often the answer is no. So moving on, in verse 17, it says, And Hashem said, shall I conceal from Avraham what I do? Now that Avraham is surely to become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall bless themselves by him. So later on, in later times, I think this is Ramban, that he says, in the nations might say, look what Hashem did, and Avram allowed this. And because Avram was to be a great nation, they'll look at the Jewish people and say, your ancestor could have put a stop to this and didn't. He could have prayed for them and didn't. So therefore, the, um, Hashem told Avram about it, so Avram would plead for the cities. Okay, um, so it continues. On page 83. Verse 19, for I have loved him because he commands the children in his household after him that may keep the way of Hashem doing charity and justice in order that Hashem might then bring upon Avram that which he has spoken of him. So then it continues, verse 20, so Hashem had said, because of the outcry of Sodom and Amor has become great, this is what he's telling Avraham, and because their sin has been very grave, I'll descend and see if they act in accordance with his outcry, then destruction, and if not, I will know. This is a very cryptic verse. First of all, what does it mean that Hashem is descending? And what's he saying? I have to see if they're, if, if, if they, if, 
if what they're doing, they're actually doing what I hear, I'm hearing they're doing. And if not, I'll know. What does that mean? God knows what's happening. He doesn't need to go down and look. So the Ramban says that um, the point is that Hashem was telling Abraham that it's not a decided matter, meaning that a decision has not been made to destroy them because if that decision had already been made, praying for them wouldn't do any good. The decision has been made. So Hashem was letting Avraham know it hasn't been decided yet, and therefore you still have the opportunity to daven to pray for them. The, um, the Urchaim, though, says that, um, that when, when it says here that Hashem is descending, he's going down, that means that, if we, that there are two different ways we could be judged for our sins. That we could be judged based on the act that we did, if we just look at the act that someone did, let's say a person, um, an example, um, let's say a person was overcome by temptation and um, they decided they needed a cheeseburger and they made themselves a, che made themselves a cheeseburger. So you could say the Torah says, thou shalt not, um, make your, you shalt not cook milk and meat together and eat it. And um, the person did it, so that they did a bad thing. They did something that's against what the Torah, they did something that's against what's, what's stated in the Torah. Or you could look at it as the Torah is, everything in the Torah, every mitzvah in the Torah is a commandment of God. God is the king of kings, he's in, the one who runs the entire world. So every myth, every sin a person does is really an act of rebellion against Hashem. So it's not just, a, it's not just the sin itself that you have to take that has to be taken into account, but it's what the sin means that the person's rebelling against the king and not just any king, not just a human king. They're rebelling against against Hashem, so and they should be struck down. It's that's an act of rebellion, and rebellion is a mutiny or what's the word? It's a treason. It's a treasonous act, which is well when it comes to um, civil law, American law as well. American not so much, but when it comes to law, if a person does a sin. If a person does something illegal, so you try them and they're punished for that illegal act. But if they commit treason, then they're hanged. You hang, you hang traitors. And um, every sin we do against Hashem is, an, is a traitorous act. So we should just be struck down immediately. So here where it says that I will go down and see what they did, that means that Hashem's saying that I'm not going to judge them as having committed a treasonous act against Hashem. Hashem's not going to judge us based on who He is, based on Hashem. Hashem is going to judge us just based on the act that they did as if it were committed to another man. So Hashem is lowering himself in a sense to um, a, lowering him, it's Hashem to our perspective, to what does this mean from a human perspective for someone having done what, what they've done. And um, that's why, I think this is, I saw expressed by somebody, that that's why um, it says that, that's why Avram felt that he would be able to argue with Hashem, because Hashem's looking at from a human perspective, so Avram could, could argue with him if they really deserve it. Okay. So moving on, Avram, I'm going to, um, it begins in verse 23. Avram came forward and said, will you stamp out the righteous along with the wicked? What if there should be 50 righteous people in the midst of the city? Would you still stamp it out rather than spare the place? for the sake of 50 righteous people within it. And Hashem said, I would, but they don't have 50 righteous people. And Avram kept on asking for more and more until finally Hashem told him that they don't even have 10 righteous people in these cities. And um, after that, Avram gave up. And skipping to page 85, verse 33, Hashem departed when he had finished speaking to Avram, and Avram returned to his place. And that's the departing that is mentioned according to this um, Arachayim, the parting means that he's going back up to, from a human, looking at what the sin would mean if it was sinned against man, and back up to heaven in a sense, to um, what it means being sinned against Hashem. Okay, so now chapter 19, it states, I mentioned this earlier, page 85, chapter 19, about um, Lot um, being a host at danger to his life. The two angels came to Sodom in the evening, and Lot was sitting at the gate of Sodom. Now Lot San stood up to meet them, and he bowed face down to the ground. And he said, Behold now, my lords, turn about, please, to your servant's house, spend the night, and wash your feet, then wake up early and go your way. And they said, No, rather we'll spend the night in the square. And he urged them very much, so they turned towards him and came to his house. He made a feast for them and baked matzahs, and they ate. They had not yet lain down when the townspeople, Sodomites, 
or sodomites, converged upon the house from young to old. All the people came from every quarter. And they called to Lot and said to him, where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out that we may know them. Okay, so um, to understand this, I've mentioned before, but Sodom was a place that they made it illegal to, um, to host guests to the point that they would, um, they would kill the host. It was a punishable by death. And I say to say many things about, what, about how they would punish, how they tried to keep guests away. That, um, that the Metro says that when a, when a guest, when somebody would come to town looking for a place to stay and they were tall, so they would put them in a short bed. They would give them a very small bed and say, oh no, you don't fit, we'll make sure, we'll try to make it fit and they would cut off their legs so they would fit. And if it was a tall person, I'm sorry, if it was a short person, they would give them a very tall bed, very long bed, and then say, um, this bed's too long for you and they would stretch out their limbs to say, we need to do this so you could fit in the bed. And um, etc. And here it says, where are the men who came to you tonight? In verse five, bring them out to us that we may know them. The Ramban says that, that we may know them is knowing in a biblical sense that they'll um, commit, um, they'll sodomize them. And um, the, the reason for this was also, they wanted to discourage guests. And if people, if word gets out, that you go to Sodom, you get sodomized, people would stay away and they wouldn't have any guests, which is what they were looking for. It was also illegal in the city of Sodom to give money to poor. And all of this was for a, the same reason in the Talmud, it discusses the idea of Sodom and Mida Sodom, the, at the acting with the ethics of Sodom. And the idea was that if a person, um, if we start giving money to the poor and we start hosting guests, so more poor will come and more guests will come and we'll end up spend, they'll take more and more of our money. And they had a, like a very strong capitalist perspective that what's mine is mine and what's yours is yours. Meaning that property value is, the, our property is so sacred that we, we don't want to be sharing it with anyone else. Not only do we, hold, do we believe that sharing it with someone else is unethical, but they're saying for anyone else to share their money with someone else is unethical because if someone else shares, if someone else shares money with someone else, people are going to be coming around and they're going to be asking me, and that's going to make me uncomfortable. So they made it illegal for anybody to do any kindness for others, just to make sure that they feel comfortable um, avoiding that as well. Okay, so as it says, bring them out to us that we may know them. And um, if you look at the way it's spoken out, it said, the sodomites converged upon the house from young to old. All the people came from every quarter. What is going on? And how is it that like these angels come to town and all of a sudden, everybody in town, it says from the young to the old, everybody in town is converging on this house to, um, to take care of this. What's going on? How are they, why, why did it make such a big, um, such a big deal that everybody had to come. So Rabbi Shimon Schwab says that um, it's, he expresses an idea that these, these were angels and angels are purely spiritual beings. And the people of the city of Sodom had fallen so far that they were purely evil. They were purely, um, they were, they were purely on the evil side. And he said that evil is attracted to spirituality, that it wants, it, 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 it's like a magnet where opposites attract. And when they had that, and it's, it's almost like a vacuum and the spirituality is, is, um, is substance. And it's just like the vacuum just wants to suck in the substance. And so they just, they felt they all were drawn, they had a strong, were strongly drawn towards this house. Um, he brings also a Rambam, a statement of the Rambam, Maimonides from the, his, um, his commentary on the Mishnah, that um, Sodom had reached the point, what, what our sages call that their, their, their measure was full. It's malisas and their measure was full. They have a measure, a, me a basket, where um, their deplorable acts would be thrown in, that um, every, everything bad they did is, fills it up, and then at some point it's full. They have completely exhausted any space for more evil deeds, and they lost their right to live, basically. It's time for them to be destroyed, because they, are, they have become completely evil. And the Rambam says when that happens, um, with, people are given one last chance. There's like one last hurrah that Hashem gives them. And that's a, Hashem gives them an incredibly difficult test. They have a challenge where they have a very, very strong 
um, taiva, a very strong desire for something that's prohibited. And if they could just overcome that desire, that would allow them to be saved. But otherwise, this is their last chance, and if they, if they don't pass that challenge, so then they're done for. But even when, once, they, once their, their measure is filled or when it's close to being filled, they're given one last chance. And this was the last chance for the people of Sodom, that Hashem gave them an incredibly strong desire to do ill to these guests, and, um, and it was their last chance. If they could overcome that desire, so then they would be saved. But otherwise, the city would be wiped out. And that's why they all converged there, because they had this, um, they had the, this, what that was their challenge. And it continues on page 87, Lot went out to them at the entrance and shut the door behind him, and he said, I beg you, my brothers, do not act wickedly. See now I have two daughters who have never known a man. I shall bring them out to you and do to them as they please. But to these men do nothing in as much as they have come under the shelter of my roof. And here you see that even the Lot grew up in Avram's house and learned the, um, learned the importance of being welcoming and, um, and protecting your guests, but he, he was corrupted, that he was corrupt and he learned the lesson in a corrupt way. And um, whereas an, any normal person would do anything to defend their daughters, that's fathers see that's the, their most important job in life is protect their little girls, protect their girls. Here we see that Lot was so confused, corrupted and he, and to him, his daughters were less important than, his, like, guests was the paramount important, and his daughters didn't matter to him as much. And, that was, and because of that corruption, he was punished that everybody's going to laugh at him on account of his daughters. Like, we'll see later that um, he committed incest with an incestual act with his daughters that the world laughed at him for. It. Okay, so now moving on, in verse 8, and they said... Um, these are the angels said, stand back. Then they said, this fellow came, this fellow came to, so I'm sorry, um, these are the people saying, they said, stand back. Then they said, this fellow came to sojourn and would act as a judge. Now we will treat you worse than them. They pressed exceedingly upon the man upon Lot and they approached to break down the, the door. Then the angels told um, Lot to, um, I'm sorry, then the angels brought them in and the angels struck all the people with blindness so they couldn't find the door. And, um, and the angels told Lot, leave this place, leave the city, um, don't look back, because it's going to be destroyed. He told Lot, take your family and leave. So in verse 15, it states, and just as Don was breaking, the angels urged Lot on, saying, get up, take your wife, your two daughters who are present, lest you be swept away because of the sin of the city. In verse 16, still he lingered, he couldn't leave. So the men grasped him by his hand, his wife's hand, the hand of his two daughters, and I showed mercy on him, and they took him out and left him outside the city. And it was as they took him out that one said, flee for your life, do not look behind you, nor stop anywhere in the plain. Flee to the mountain, lest you be swept away. And um, let's see, um, skipping a little bit. In verse 23, this, on page 89, the sun rose upon the earth and loaded right at Soar. Now Hashem had caused sulfur and fire to rain upon Sodom and Amorah from Hashem out of the heavens. He overturned these cities and the entire plain with inhabitants of the cities, excuse me, and the vegetation of the soil. His wife peered behind him and she became a pillar of salt. So two things about this incident. Um, first of all, this, uh, this, that she became a pillar of salt. And say to say that's measure for measure because um, when Lod had, the Medr says, when Lod had welcomed these men, these angels, into his house, so, and he was preparing the food, um, he asked his wife to salt the food, and um, because she was angry at him for welcoming in guests, so she went around to all the neighbors asking to borrow salt in order that they should know that they had guests, and thereby these guests should be punished. So because she was the one who told everybody about it, so she was, she became a pillar of salt. And now what's this, what's the problem with turning around? Why were they commanded not to turn around and she was punished for turning around? So the um, Rashi says that, or this maybe actually be there in Ban, that um, they didn't really deserve to be saved. That even though they had welcome guests, but especially Lot's family didn't deserve to be saved. They were really saved on account of Avraham, on account of their connection with Avraham. So um, when someone really deserves to be punished with others, 
it's inappropriate for them to be looked to actually see the punishment. They shouldn't be standing on the outside watching as others are punished in a way that they really deserve to be. And because they, she did that, so she was punished. She shouldn't have, look, she shouldn't have looked. Okay, so the, these cities were destroyed. So now in verse 30, now Lot went up from Tzor and settled in the mountains, his two daughters with him, page 91, for he was afraid to remain in Tzor. He dwelt in a cave with his two daughters. And on page 91, verse 31, the older one said to the younger, our father is old and there's no man in the land to marry us in the usual manner. Come, let us ply our father with wine and lay with him that we may give life to offspring through our father. So they applied their father with wine that night and the older one came and lay with their father and he was not aware of her lying down and of getting up. And it was the next day, the older one said to the younger, behold, I lay with my father last night, let us ply with wine tonight as well. You come lay with him that we may give life to offspring through our father. And that's what they did. And in verse 36, thus those two daughters conceived from their father, the old, older boy's son, and she called his name Moab. He is the ancestor of Moab until this day. And the younger one also bore a son, and she called his name Ben-Ami. And he is the ancestor of the children of Ammon until this day. So these two, the daughters of Lot, saw the destruction that was wrought upon these, this, uh, Sodom, Gomorrah, and the surrounding cities, and they thought the world came to an end, and they were the only survivors. So they felt that just like um, Adam, Adam and Chava, so they had, so their sons would have had to marry their sisters because they would have been the only people in the world. So the world was started by, um, by brother-sister incest, I'm sorry, by in, from incest. So they felt that they, that they were restarting the world and, they, and there was only one man. And um, so they each, one needed a son, one needed a daughter to continue the settlement of the world. So they really had good intentions. But, um, and because of those and those, that good intentions that they had and because of, because of um, Lot's hospitality that he learned from the house of Avram, there was still some good in them. And from, the, from these unions that look completely disgusting, from these unions came two um, great people, then, and one of them being Ruth, Ruth, who was um, born from, who was from the nation of Moab, a descendant of Moab, and um, I think Nama, but the wife of Shlomo HaMelech, the mother of Rechavam, the wife of King Solomon, who's the mother of Shlomo Solomon's successor, Rechavam, um, came from the nation of Ammon. So there were two people from these two nations, one from Moab, one from Ammon, one from each of these daughters that um, ended up being the ancestors of Mashiach, that Rus was David, King David's great, great grandmother. And um, Nama was King Shlomo's wife, the mother of Rehavam. So both of them were the ancestors and of all our kings and the ancestors of Mashiach. Okay, so now moving on. Um, page 91, chapter 20, Avram moved to Grar. And in verse 2, Avram said to of Sarai, his wife, she is my sister. So Avramel, king of Grar, sent and took Sarah. He said once again, she is my sister because he was bothered that um, when he went to the Philistine, we'll see later, but when he went to the Philistine um, cities, so everyone was asking, who's this? Who's this? Who's this lady? Who's this lady? And he felt that, that um, when a stranger comes, that's not, the only, that's not the first question you ask. And he felt that he was in danger. So he told them he was, she was his sister. Okay. So in verse 3, And Hashem came to Abimelech in a dream by night and said, Behold, you are to die because of the woman you have taken. Moreover, she is a married woman. So Abimelech, in page 93, said, I didn't know. He said she was my sister. And she herself said this, and um, in verse 6, Hashem said to him in the dream, I too knew that it was in, in the innocence of your heart that you did this. I too prevented you from sinning against me. That is why I did not permit you to touch her. But now return the man's wife, for she is a prophet. And for he is a prophet, he'll pray for you and you will live. But if you do not return to it, be aware that you shall die, you and all that is yours. And I say to say that the, he was threatened because she told him, once um, Avimelech kidnapped her, she told him that she was married to Avraham, but he didn't want to listen until Hashem came to him and told him that um, Avraham will know what you did. Avraham's a prophet. He'll know what, what happened. If you, touched, if you didn't touch her, he'll know. If you touched her, he'll know, and you're going to die if you touch her. Okay. So um, continuing on in verse 10, and when Avimelech was returning to her, and Avimelech said to Avraham, what did you see that you did such a thing? Why did you say that she's, my, that she's your sister and not your wife? And verse 11, and Avram said, because I said, there is but no fear of God in this place, and they will slay me because of my wife. 
Wherever she is indeed my sister, my father's daughter, though not my mother's daughter, and she became my wife. Not literally his father's daughter, she was his father's granddaughter. She was his, um, Sarah was his niece. And Avra, so Avraham um, felt that um, a niece could be called a sister. People refer to their close relatives, even if it's not a sister, an actual sister as a sister. So it's not a, really a lie. And um, he said, I recognize there wasn't fear of God here. Okay, so on page 95 in verse 14, so Avimel took flocks and cattle and servants and maid servants and gave them to Avram, and he returned his wife sorry to him. So now Avram is very wealthy. And in verse 15, Avimel said, Behold, my land is before you, settle wherever you see fit. And to Sarah he said, Behold, I've given your brother a thousand pieces of silver. Behold, let it be for you an eye covering for all who are with you, to all you, and to all you will be vindicated. Meaning, um, people won't look at her contemptuously and think that um, Avimelech had um, treated her, um, had actually mistreated her. Okay, so now moving on in verse one. Um, Hashem had remembered Sarah as he had said and Hashem did for Sarah as he had spoken. Sarah conceived and bore a son to Avram in his old age at the point in time of which Hashem had spoken with him. Avram called the name of his son who was born to him, whom Sarah had borne him, Yitzchak. So his name was Yitzchak. I mentioned that um, Yitzchak was named after, it, it comes from the word Tzachak, which, mean, which means laughter, but the Medra says also that the letters of the name Yitzchak refer to different aspects of who Yitzchak was. That the Yud, the first letter of Yitzchak has a numerical 10, represents the 10 commandments that her, his ancestors would get. The letter Tzadi, the second letter has a numerical 90, represents the age of the miracle that Sarah had a child at the, at the age of 90. And the ches, the, um, the, is, the, the numerical value was eight, that um, he had a bris mila, he was circumcised at eight days old. And the kuf, the last letter is the numerical value is 100, that Avram was 100 when he, he was born. Okay, and it continues. Sarah said, God has made laughter for me. Whoever will, hear will laugh for me, there'll be laugh and joy. And she said, who is this one who sent to Avram Sobel and his children? For I have born a son in his old age. And in verse 8, the child grew and was weaned. Avram made a great feast on the day Yitzhak was weaned. That means um, it was done nursing. In verse 9, Sarah saw the son of Hagar the Egyptian, whom she had born to Avram, mocking. So she said to Avram, drive out the slave woman with her son, for the son of that slave woman shall not inherit with my son with Yitzhak. This verse is very cryptic. It says she saw the son of Hagar the Egyptian whom she had born to Avraham mocking. With the, we know who Yishmael was. Yishmael has been discussed earlier. It could have very easily said she saw Yishmael mocking. What's this? Yishmael, the son of Hagar the Egyptian whom she had born to Avraham mocking. So um, the Sforno says that if you look at the verse very carefully, it could be read a different way. I'll read the Hebrew. Ratera Sarah Sarah saw as Ben Hagar Hamitzris Asher Yolda LaAvraham Mitzafek. She saw the son of Hagar the Egyptian that was born to Avraham was laughing, was um, mocking. And um, he explains that there's a medrash that I kind of skipped over before. There's a medrash that people were, um, were laughing, were um, speaking, were mocking Avraham about the birth of Yitzvah. They said that Avraham and Sarah were married for a really long time. Sarah was 90, Avraham was 100 when he was born. And after she was taken by um, Avimelech, the Philistine king, and all of a sudden she has a son. So they said it must be that she, it's not Avraham's son, it's Avimelech's son. And they were mocking Avram. So then he invited everybody to that feast and they looked at Yitzchak and saw that he, there was a very strong resemblance to Avram. He looked exactly like Avram. So it was very clear that he was Avraham's son. So here where it says, so here what it, this verse means is that Sarah saw the son of Hagar the Egyptian. That was born to Avraham was mocking. The mocking was about the child that was born to Avraham, meaning that she heard Yishmael claiming that Yitzchak was not Avraham's son, rather Yitzchak was Avimelech's son. 
And because of that, and that was the mocking that he was doing, and Sarah recognized that he's not saying this on his own. It's something that everybody knows. So when you, you, you hear a child saying something about others, especially if they're saying negative things about other people, they're probably not saying it on their own. They probably heard it at home. And she's saying, if he's saying this, he must be hearing it from his mother. And what's he trying to do? His mother's trying to take the inheritance away from my son Yitzchak and give it to Yishmael instead by claiming that Yitzchak is not Avram's son. And that's why she said in verse... And the ten, so she said to Avram, drive out the slave woman with her son, for the son of the slave woman shall not inherit with my son, with Yitzchak. She recognized that when he was looking to take the inheritance away from Yitzchak, she said he shouldn't be inheriting with my son, with Yitzchak. And the matter greatly distressed Avram regarding his son. So Hashem said to Avram, be not distressed over the youth of your slave woman. Whatever Sarah tells you, heed her voice. And, um, but the son of the slave woman as well will I make into a nation, for he is your offspring. So Avraham sent them away with some water. And in verse 15, when the water of the skin was consumed, she cast off the boy beneath one of the trees. She went and sat down at a distance some bow shots away for her. She said, let me not see the death of the child. And she sat at a distance, lifted her voice and wept. That Yishmael was, they ran out of water and he was, um, and he was dying. And she, as a, seems to be, she wasn't the world's greatest mother. And rather than stay with her son as he was, as he was dying, she didn't want to hear it and she walked away. Hashem heard the cry of the youth and the angel of God called to Hagar from heaven and said to her, what troubles you, Hagar? Fear not, for God has indeed heeded the cry of the youth in his present state. Arise, lift up the youth and grasp your hand upon him, for I'll make a great nation of him. Then Hashem opened her eyes, she perceived a well of water, she went, filled the skin with water, and gave the youth to drink. <laughs> it states, God was with the youth, he grew up, he dwelled in the desert, became an accomplished archer, he lived in the desert apart, and his mother took a wife for him from the land of Egypt. Okay, so now, moving back a little bit, in verse 17, it, say, it ends up, fear not for Hashem, as he did the cry of the youth in his present state. So on this, this that phrase, in his present state, so our sages say that um, the, angels of Hashem, the angels of Hashem did not want to Hashem to save Yishmael, that Hashem was going to save Yishmael, and the heavenly angels protested and said, the descendants of Yishmael are in the future when the, are going to cause the Jews much pain. When the, um, and when the Jewish people were exiled and with the destruction of the first temple, they were exiled to Babylon. And as they were on their way to Babylon, so the, um, they were chained and hungry and thirsty, and they passed by the Ishmaelites, the descendants of Yishmael, and asked them, could we have some water? And the descendants of Yishmael said, first, we'll give you something to eat. And they gave them dried, um, they gave them salty fish, salty food to make them very thirsty. And then they brought them out water skins. They brought them out their um, leather water containers, but instead of filling them with water, they inflated them with air. And when the Jews held them up to drink, so their stomachs became filled with air. They tried to drink and their stomachs became filled with air and it killed them. And um, so the angels were saying that his descendants are going to kill the Jews in, their time of, in the time of distress. How can you keep him alive? And that's the statement here that it's saying that... Um, that Hashem, he did the cry of the youth in his present state. That Hashem says, I don't judge people. Hashem says that the divine judgment is not based on what a person will do in the future. It's based on where a person is at this moment. That we're, ju that we're living in the moment, we're judged in the moment. Not, we're not judged based on, the, based on what we're going to do in the future. And the Ali Shur says from, a, um, from, uh, from the statement, in, based on the statement in the Talmud, that when it comes to the judgment of Rosh Hashanah at least, this is true as well that we're judged and in our present state. And he says, it doesn't mean that we're not even judged on the past. That when we're judged on Rosh Hashanah, we're not judged based on what we're going to do in the future. And we're not judged based on what we did in the past. We're based on our present state. We're based on where we are in that moment. So if we're able, it's very difficult to um, change who we are in one moment and usually what we did, did in the past very strongly if influences who we are. But if we're able to do tshuva, if we're able to repent and, um, be, and be righteous in that moment, that's how we're judged on Rosh Hashanah. 
that well, we're judged for all our actions later, unless we erase them with tshuva, we're judged for later actions um, after the, the final judgment. But on Rosh Hashanah, we're judged as we are in that moment, not what we will be tomorrow and not what we were yesterday. Who are we right now? It's just like a picture of us in one moment in time, and that's how we're judged. Okay, the Rambando says another explanation of, in um, how do they translate it? In the present state, that literally it means, um, the Hebrew is Basher Husham, as he is there. And the Ramban says what that means is that Hashem's, and Hashem answered their prayers in such a great way that they didn't even have to go looking for water. Hashem didn't tell them there's water just over the next hill, just go there and you'll find water to satisfy yourself. What it says there, then Hashem opened her eyes, she perceived a well of water. It was exact, right there they had water to drink. So when they were answered, they were answered right where they were that they didn't even have to make any effort to go get to go get the water. It was right there. Okay, so now um, um, Avram made a covenant with Avimelech. Avimelech asked Avram if they could make this covenant with him, and Avram agreed. Um, and they agreed not to harm each other for three generations. As it states in verse 23, Now swear to me here by God that you will not deal falsely with me, nor with my son, nor with my grandson, according to the kindness I have done with you, do with me, and they made that oath, they made that covenant. And many of us say to say that he shouldn't have done that, and that he was punished for that. But, um, okay, and one of the punishments, it's just because I'm teaching this in my Wednesday night class, my prophets class, is that um, it states in, where is that? Um, in verse 28, it says, Avram set seven ewes, that seven female sheep of the flock by themselves. Avimel said to Avram, what are these seven ewes which you have set by themselves? And he replied, because you are to take these seven ewes from me, that it may serve to me as a testimony that I do this well. So they sealed this covenant with seven sheep. And I say to say, because of that, a, few, a number of things would happen. One of them being that um, the Ark of the Covenant was captured by the Philistines, this group, and um, was kept there for seven months. The Philistines kept the Ark of the Covenant for seven months um, as a punishment for Abraham sealing this covenant with these seven sheep. Okay, so now in, on page 101, chapter 22, it happened after these things that Hashem tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he replied, here I am. And he said, please take your son, your only one whom you love, Yitzchak, and go to the land of Maria, and bring him there as an offering upon one of the mountains, which I shall tell you. And um, so this is Hashem's testing Avram by telling him to bring his son as an offering. The Ramban says the idea of a test, what, what, what's this idea of Hashem testing us? Hashem knows what's in our heart. Hashem knows where we're holding. He doesn't need to see us do it. And he said, because where we're holding is only potential. And um, that means that we, were, we have the ability to overcome obstacles. But until we actually overcome those obstacles, all it is is potential, but we don't want to just have potential. We want to actually fulfill our potential. And that fulfillment is when we actually bring that into action. And that's what it, the test is. The test is an opportunity for us to fulfill our potential in the world of action and bring it into, a con bring it, make it concrete and bring it into not just potential, but um, bring it into greatness that we've achieved, make potential into achievement. Okay, so, and another thing that's very interesting here is that it doesn't tell him where to go. It's, he says, go to the land of Maria, bring him there as an offering upon one of the mountains, which I shall tell you. He doesn't just tell him, go to the mountain, which our sages say is Mount Maria, the, Mount, the Temple Mount. Um, he kind of just hinted to him, and the Kleyaka points out, and I think it's Parshish Re'e, um, where it says, L'shechna is tindrushu basem shama, that you shall search out my my presence and um, settle there and, and come to there is that there's a theme with the Beis HaMikdash that we never are really told where it's supposed to be clearly and it's something that we have to search out and um, that, that the Shekhinah isn't it's not something that's given to us it's something that it takes searching to find it we, it takes work and um, that's Something that's expressed from the, our first contact with the Temple Mount, which is right here, is that he's not told exactly where it is. He has to look for it. Okay, so then um, Avram found it. 
And on page 103, verse 6, and Avram took the wood for the offering, placed it on Yitzchak, his son. He took it in his hand, the fire, the fire, the knife. The two of them went together. Then Yitzchak spoke to Avram, his father, and said, Father, and he said, here, here I am, my son. And he said, here the fire, the wood, but where is the lamb for the offering? And Avram said, God will seek out for himself the lamb for the offering, my son. And the two of them went together. I say to say that that my son was a hint to Yitzchak that his son, Yitzchak, was to be the offering, and Yitzchak understood that, and yet it continues, the two of them went together, that Yitzchak went with Avram. Then in verse 9, they arrived at the place where God had spoken to him. Avram built the altar there. He arranged the wood. He bound Yitzchak, his son, and placed him on the altar atop the wood. Avram stretched out his hand and took the knife to slaughter his son. And the angel of Hashem called him from heaven and said, Avram, Avram. And he said, here I am. And he said, do not stretch out your hand against the lad, nor do anything to him now. For now, I know you are a God-fearing man, since you have not withheld your son, your only one from me. And Avram raised his eyes and saw, behold, a ram afterwards caught in a thicket by its horn. So Avram took the ram, offered it as an offering instead of his son. And Avram called the name of, name, name of the site Hashem Yira, as it said, on this mountain Hashem will be seen. And there's a very strong question on this whole incident that I introduced it that a test of Hashem is in order to bring our potential, make it concrete, make our potential achievement instead of just being a potential. So what happened? Avraham went and brought his son and bound him on an altar, but he was stopped before he did the act. He was never actually supposed to do it. He was just supposed to be ready to do it. So at the end of the day, all it was was potential. It never actually happened. So how could we say that the test brought the, his potential to fruition and brought it into concrete action if he never brought it, brought it into concrete action? He, never, he didn't actually go through with it because he was stopped before he did. So um, some of the commentaries say, I think the Meshachach, but some of the commentaries say that there are different levels of existence in this world. We've talk, talked about this many times in our class, and there's the world of action, and there's the world of intention. And because Avraham, he didn't just have the potential to do it, he actually got to the point where he, intend, he intended to do it, and they, just the physical act wasn't done. And that, that's just in the physical world, it wasn't done. But in the spiritual world where, um, the, the, in the spiritual world where it's a matter of intention, so since he intended to do it and was stopped from doing it, it was actually spiritually done. It wasn't just that he meant to do it and it never happened. It, in, in the spiritual world, it actually did happen. So we're not celebrating that Avram agreed to do something and never got around to it. When, when we're celebrating the Akedas Yitzchak and we're asking for the merit of the, this binding of Yitzchak to stand for us, it's because Avram actually did it in the spiritual sense. Avram actually did it because in the spiritual sense, it's the intention that is the spiritual aspect of the act that um, actually happened. So in the spiritual sense, he actually brought his son as an offering. Okay, so now moving on. In verse 15, the angel of Hashem on page 105 called to Avram a second time from heaven and he said, by myself, I swear the word of Hashem that because you have done this thing, I have not withheld your son, you're only one, then I shall surely bless you and greatly increase your offering like the stars of the, your off, increase your offering like the stars of the heavens, like the sand on the seashore, and your offspring shall inherit the gates of its enemy and all the nations there shall bless themselves by your offspring because you have listened to my voice. Um, Avram returned to his young men. They stood and went together to Beersheba, and Avram came to Beersheba. And it, and it concludes in verse 20, it came to pass after these things that Avram was told, saying, Behold, Milka too has born children to Nachi, your brother, Uz his firstborn, Buz his brother, Kamul his father of Haram, and Chesed, Chaza, Pildar, Yidlaf, and Besuel, and Besuel begot Rebekah, Rivka, and um, these are the eight Milka bore to Nachar from his brother and his concubine. His name was Reuma, also bore children, Teva, Gacham, Tachash, and Maka. So now that Yitzchak had gone through the Akedah, that he was bound on the altar and he was offered as an offering, so now he um, became more sacred and because he was an offering. And now it's his wife was born, his future wife was born, Rivka. Now it was time for him to get married. And he, in a sense, became a different person after being brought as an offering. So now he needs, his wife is in a sense a different person. So it mentions that his wife was born now. Okay, shkayach, shkayach. Everybody have a great 